God's thanking you for every good thing. We thank you, Lord God, for a wonderful salvation, for the eternal truths of your word, and for your Holy Spirit that, again, leads us into all truth. More than this, Father God, we ask these things would not simply increase our knowledge with any aim of increasing our knowledge, but increase our knowledge with the aim of making us more like your Son, more conformed to his image and likeness, and serving him and helping others in his name, the name in which we pray. The Lord Jesus, the one who saved us, amen. I've been asked to speak about the authority of the Word of God and heresy. The authority of the Word of God and heresy, not a subject of my choosing, and I don't understand why they'd ask somebody like me to address such a subject. <laughs> Nonetheless, let's understand three basic principles before we look to our main text. Three basic principles before we look to our main text. I've already mentioned two of these yesterday. Turn with me, first of all, please, to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 19, and there must also be factions among you in order that those who are approved may become evident among you. Or there must be factions among you to prove which is true. That word for factions in Greek is heresies, heresies, heresy. We misunderstand what a heresy is in English because of a translation issue. We normally think of it as a fundamentally false doctrine. It involves that, it includes that, but it's something more than that. Real heresy is not just the false doctrine itself, but the result of it. When people form a schism on the basis of it. When people form a schism or a faction or a split on the basis of a wrong doctrine. This can lead to other things such as the sin of party spirit, partyism, and so forth. But the idea of heresy in the Greek language, in the original Koine Greek, it's not simply the false doctrine. What makes somebody a heretic is not simply that they have a false doctrine, a fundamentally false doctrine. What makes them a heretic is they have the false doctrine, and if you don't agree with them, you're on the outs. <laughs> They're forming a schism on the basis of it. This is heresy. This is heresy. Let's go again and look at this closer. There must be heresies among you to prove which is false. God allows these things to happen to separate true believers from false believers. It is not a good thing for true believers to be divided from each other. But heresy is designed to bring division between people who claim to be Christian. Heresy is a basis of division by God's own design. We cannot be united with heretics. Now the only way you can be united with a heretic, by definition, is to take on board their false teaching. <laughs> if you don't take on board their false teaching, the system will be automatic. Let's look at the second verse, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, please. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Going back to my wayward youth, I was taught in university, that, well, these were the early days when they were just beginning to do red bone marrow transplants to increase the red cell count, the erythrocyte cell count in leukemia patients. It was in its infancy then. Now, of course, it's much more developed. I have a cousin who's probably the top osteocarcinoma surgeon in the west coast of America, and he does this stuff all the time. You've got osteocytes, and then you've got erythrocytes. You've got bone tissue, bone cells, and you've got the red cells that are in the marrow. But between the two, where the two kinds of tissues, two kinds of tissues come together, it dyes stains like a rust color. Well, where does the osteocytes end and the erythrocytes begin? Where does the blood cells, red blood cells begin and where does the bone cells end? It's not so easy to tell. It's done with, surgically with a micrometer, with a surgical micrometer. That relationship is not easy to figure out, even clinically, even with modern science. Of course, they can do it now with, my, with a micrometer, but it's not easy certainly not to the naked eye. In biblical times, it would have been nearly impossible to say where one ends and one picks up. Well, that is like the relationship between soul and spirit. Soul and spirit. We are three-dimensional men and women. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Paul explains this, you know you not your temples of the Holy Spirit. One of the differences between the lie of Darwinism and what the New Bible says about 
the nature of, 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 the, of the homo sapien, of the human, is that Darwinism says we're two-dimensional. We simply have a body and a soul, and consciousness is merely a byproduct of electrobiochemical activity, activity of morons, of brain, of brain cells. The scripture tells us we have a third dimension. We're imagio dei beings, we're tripartite, we're three. Because God is triune, we are made in his image and likeness. God has a body, a soul, and a spirit. Prepare thou a body for me. God incarnate, that's Jesus, the Son. God has a spirit, obviously. The Holy Spirit touches the depths of God. Who has known the mind of the Father? Well, God has a soul. We are made in his image and likeness. Darwinism says we are simply apes with better DNA. But be careful. So does secular psychology. Secular psychology reduces people to two-dimensional beings. Consciousness and, and sorry, spiritual function is merely seen as a psychological function. Be it the two basic forms of theology, of, of psychology, be it the Jungian or the Freudian, they're the same. Carl Jung did see a spiritual dimension to man, which he called the collective unconscious, but he simply saw it as psychological. Now this goes hand in hand with Eastern religion. Eastern religion is the same way. They confuse the soul and spirit. Secular psychology confuses the soul and spirit. Psychology is a pseudoscience because it's non-quantitative, okay? You can have a legitimate clinical and scientific basis to psychiatric medicine because it looks at physiology. But pure psychology, pure behavioral science is a pseudoscience. It's not even real science, it's non-quantitative. It's really the religion of man except it's bad theology because it only sees men and women as two-dimensional instead of three-dimensional. Now there is, however, something called biblical psychology, better known as the book of Proverbs. If you really want to understand human behavior, if you want to understand why people behave the way they do, read Proverbs. Proverbs understands the true nature of man, that we're three-dimensional. God breathed on Adam, he became a living soul. He breathed on Adam, and Adam became a living soul. What people are psychologically is a hybrid, a, a, a homogeneous hybrid, of what we are spiritually and what we are organically, okay? In other words, mental illness never originates in the mind. If somebody's out to lunch, there's either something wrong with them physically or something wrong with them spiritually or both. Amen. Mental illness does not come from the mind. You can have behavioral abnormalities. People do crazy things because of a reaction to a drug or hyperthyroidism or all kinds of things but there's a physiological basis to it, okay? Um, or there's something spiritually wrong with that person. Psychology is pseudo-medicine, it is pseudo-science, it is pseudo-theology. Now we're told the Word of God is like that surgical instrument that can separate the erythrocytes from the osteocytes. It separates soul from spirit. Is that really the Holy Spirit or just your mind? Is that a real prophecy? Or is it just, as Jeremiah said, they prophesy from the futility and deception of their own mind? Is that a real tongue or is that just babbling? Is that a real word of knowledge or is it your imagination? Is it real? Well, the first and foremost test is the word of God. Is it scriptural? That is God's first instrument to make that determination. We are called to judge is something psychological or is it spiritual? We're called to make that judgment. Now the word there in Greek is kritikos. Kritikos. We get the word critical. Not critical in the sense of fault finding, but in the sense of judging, assessing, evaluating. Where is this coming from? Is it something the Lord is really showing you or saying or doing? Or is it just your own head? Now of course among modern the modern church, I've been bearing in mind I'm a moderate Pentecostal, moderate charismatic myself. I just try to be a biblically based one. But as Chuck Smith once said, the charismatic movement has too often been charismania. Beware of hyper Pentecostalism and ultra charismatic type churches. They're confusing the soul and spirit. They don't want to discern or judge things on the basis of scripture, they just want to let anything happen. And you see this. I've pointed this out before. The fruit of the Spirit is a krete, self-control. says that twice in the New Testament. Oh, it must be God. I couldn't control it. It must be the Lord. 
by virtue of the fact they couldn't control it, proves prima facie it can't possibly be the Lord. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control, not the lack of it. Throw the Bible out the window and throw your brain out the window when you're, while you're at it. We're not called to be like that. We're called to be critical. Not fault-finding critical, but criticals. We are called to judge on the basis of Scripture. That's the second verse. Scripture today is being suspended in the name of subjective revelation. This is Gnosticism, this is mysticism, this is lunacy, even though they may be calling it charismata, it is not charismata. It is what Chuck Smith coined as charismania. Some years ago he warned about this. Let's continue one more, one more verse, one more passage. Turn to Romans, please, chapter 16. Verse 17. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you have learned and turn away from them. Some Bibles translated to mark a factious man. Today, if you don't follow the program, if a church has gone into something that's not biblical and you don't follow it, you'll be told you're divisive. If you speak out about something for what it actually is, the way Warren did when he looked at the shack and just was assessing it verse by verse, passage by passage, uh, assessing its contents passage by passage in light of Scripture, that's divisive. Understand what this is saying. The Greek word here is dikostasia. Dikostasia, where you get the word dichotomy. A fork in the road. Point. Do we get it? No. Something happens. Dichotomy. Picture a main road. And everybody's on the same road heading towards heavenly Jerusalem. But another road branches off on a 45 degree angle and heads towards Babylon. Most people go off on the 45 degree angle branching off the road they were originally on. Only a minority of people stay on the same road they were always on. The road they were always on is the apostles' teaching, the didaskin, the daskalos of the apostles. Who is the divisive one? The ones who stayed on the road or the ones who branched off from it? <laughs> it's the ones who have deviated from the apostles' teaching who are really the divisive. But because there may be more of them than there are of us, they say we're the divisive ones. <laughs> you know, that's how it works. We're told, let them go, separate from them. Stay on the road you are always on. These are three New Testament verses that every Christian should know concerning our subject this evening. Heresy and the authority of God's word. Mark those who leave the apostles' teaching. It's the apostles who explain New Testament dogma and doctrine. With these things in view, turn with me please to 1 Timothy. This is not an easy passage to understand unless you understand the original underlying Greek language. The problem is the underlying Greek language is difficult to translate. But the Spirit explicitly says in the latter times, Tode numa retos lege. The Bible is the doctrinally inspired word of God. This, however, is not the doctrinally inspired Word of God, Paul is saying. This is just the Word of God. It's as it were, say it just like this, retos. It's like a dictation. Most of Scripture is not like that. Most Scripture is the Word of God and the Word of man. Think of Jesus. He's the Word incarnate. He's the Word made flesh. Jesus is fully human and fully divine. He's 100% God, 100% man. So the scripture is 100% the word of God and 100% the word of man. 
The book of Isaiah is 100% the word of Isaiah, Ishayahu Hanavi, and the book of Isaiah is 100% the word of God. The gospel of Matthew is 100% the word of Matthew, but it's 100% the word of God. The gospel of Luke is 100% the word of Luke, but it's 100% the word of God. You can see the human element in what the authors wrote. Okay. John was writing to Jews. He was very concerned about the festal background of, of the Gospels. You see the human element is in, in his emphasis. Luke was a physician. He had an acute interest in the healing miracles of Jesus. You see the human element. Well, Paul was a rabbi. He used rabbinics. He used Kalvahoma. He used Binyan Av Mishtei Ketubim. He used the Midot of Rabbi Hillel in his writings. You see the human element and human background sanctified to God's service, incorporated into the writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but the text itself, although written by people, its content is still God-breathed. Jesus is not half human and half God, half human and half divine. He's fully human and fully divine. So the scripture is fully human and it is fully divine. Okay, it is, but this is separate. This is not something that Paul was inspired to write. That's not what it actually says in the original language. It says, say it just like this. Tode numa retos lege, oti en ustirios kairos apostezantai, tines tes pistoes. In history, at a point in history, something is going to happen. Say it just like this. It's like it's being dictated by the Holy Spirit. There's no human element in this passage. It's almost unique. A time will come in history when there will be an apostasy, a departure from the truth. This apostasy is also spoken about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Those who suggest, and there are some good people who suggested, that the apostasy in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is actually the rapture, is not plausible. Using co-texts like this one, speaking of the same thing, we see it's talking about a falling away of those who profess to be Christians. They will depart from the truth. Some will depart from the faith. The word is pisteos here, the faith. But they will pay attention to deceitful spirits, to doctrines of demons. Prosecontes when these people depart from the faith, they will come under a demonic influence, an influence that is really demonic. So while Scripture is God-breathed, what these people are teaching is going to be, as it were, demonically breathed. That's quite a thing. Now here we have a term that most people don't usually think of. There's actually two words for antichrist in Greek. Most of us know about antichristos, that which is in place of Christ or against Christ, but in place of Christ, antichristos. On the other hand, NRK kai hologos, in the beginning was the word, Jesus is the logos. The Devar Adonai in Hebrew, the Mamre in Aramaic, he's the logos. But you have a pseudo logan, a false word of God. Peter warns of this. And so does Paul. This is Antichrist, something that tries to mimic the Word of God. That will not be Holy Spirit inspired, it'll be demonically breathed, as it were. And people who claim to be Christians will get sucked up in it. But then we're told about these people. And hypocrisy. These are people who will be hypocrites. Pseudo Logan. A false word of God. These people will depart from the truth, propounding doctrines of demons, demonically inspired doctrines. There will be a pseudo logon. Jesus is the logos. You put a false logos in place of the true one. Every cult, every false religion is a pseudo logos. The Koran is a pseudo logos. You're attributing doctrinal authority to the Koran. A Roman Catholic papal encyclical is a pseudo-logos. The Talmud is a pseudo-logos. The Book of Mormon is a pseudo-logos. 
There may be elements of truth in it. They may contain certain true statements, but those things are only what Peter calls parasogzusin. They put truth next to error. They'll have elements of truth to camouflage the lie. It's all demonic. It is all demonic. Satan is much too clever to tell anybody a straight lie. He will use elements of truth to masquerade what it really is. Say it just like this, Paul. Use these words. The Spirit explicitly says, put it in these words. A time is going to come in future history when people who claim to be of the faith are going to depart from it. These people are going to be hypocrites and they're going to come under a demonic influence. And they're going to put out teachings that they're going to call the Word of God. But they're actually Antichrist, pseudo-logos. Then he continues with this. It's quite a thing. By means of the hypocrisy of liars seared with their own conscience as with a branding iron. The human conscience is the mechanism to which the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. The Greek term is eklentos, the eclectic of the spirit. Unless somebody is convicted of sin, unless an eklentos takes place, they're not going to be saved. They're not going to be regenerate. They're not going to be born again. If there's no conviction of sin, somebody will not be born again. Now again, I'm only stating a fact. In the Purpose Driven Life, and I'm only quoting from it directly, Mr. Rick Warren writes the following, and I'm only quoting him. When you see an unsaved person, an unbeliever, whatever, he doesn't use unsaved person, but when you see somebody living immorally, when you see them into substance abuse and living immorally, don't tell them they need to repent. Tell them they need Jesus in their life. After Jesus comes into their life, then he'll clean them up. Biblically, unless somebody repents, Jesus isn't coming into their life. It is a false gospel. It is a formula for false conversion. This is sinister. This is, in fact, quite evil. Now, the conscience is, again, the mechanism by which conviction of sin takes place. You lose your temper with your wife, your husband, and the Holy Spirit says, you, you know, you shouldn't have done it that way. That's a conviction. We're convicted through our conscience. When an unsaved person is convicted of sin, it's through their conscience. These people who the Holy Spirit tells Paul, they're hypocrites. These people are hypocrites who will depart from the truth in the last days, come under demonic influence, produce a false word of God, their conscience will be seared as with a branding iron. In other words, their conscience becomes dysfunctional. When the conscience is dysfunctional, no conviction of sin takes place. They become unconscionable. They can do the most unspeakable things with no sense this is wrong. And we've seen this. There's a case where a money preacher from the United States, a well-known one, came to Great Britain, and he went to unemployed people who came to his crusades, poor people, unemployed people, and he was selling Holy Ghost miracle cloths to take away debt for $40, 25 British pounds. Now, $40 to a family on the dole, that's a lot of money. To them, it's a lot of money. How can you take money from poor people? I just got back from the Philippines. We worked with Roger Oakland with these feeding programs for these kids who scavenge garbage heaps, which is where they live, trying to scratch out a meager subsistence. How can you go to a third world country, preach prosperity, and take money from those people, and then come back to California on a private jet? No conscience. Their conscience no longer works. Their conscience has become dysfunctional. Someone with advanced emphysema, they go into acute pulmonary failure. That's it. They're not going to breathe anymore unless it's assisted. <laughs> the respiratory system no longer works. Same thing. These people, their conscience no longer works. They can't be convicted now. Now this relates to something the scripture calls a spirit of error, but I won't go into it now. When people go into the pseudologos, when they get another word of God, when they begin teaching things doctrinally that they misrepresent as being from God, they're demonically inspired, they're total hypocrites, 
but they have no conscience about it. Warman was going on last night about the shack. This is exactly what it is. This is exactly what we're told to look out for. It's exactly this kind of thing. Let's look about some of the characteristics of these men. Now, the conscience is seared, but not just seared, it's seared with a branding iron. A branding iron is a seal of ownership. We have the seal of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine if somebody becomes so backslidden or so departed from the faith that they're branded with the seal of a demon? A demon owns their conscience? This is assuming they were ever Christians to begin with, which is a big assumption in some cases, I grant you. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared up by those who believe and know the truth. Forbidding marriage. Before he was a believer, supposedly a believer, I don't know if he was, Augustine of Hippo was in a Gnostic Greek sect called Mankianism. Mankianism. The Greeks were dualists. They believed everything physical was bad, everything spiritual was good. This is some of the background of Acts 17, where Paul's debating the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers at the Areopagus in, on Mars Hill in Athens. If it's physical, it's bad. If it's spiritual, it's ethereal, it's good. Now, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches the physical as good as God created it. It's just become fallen. A Greek Platonist would have no problem with John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Logos. He'd have no problem with the Logos. Until you got to verse 14, the Logos became socks, the Word became flesh, then they'd freak out. Because that's physical, it's bad. Augustine brings this into Christendom. Well, because human reproduction is a physical act, it's bad. It's more spiritual not to do that. Now, God created the male and female and said it was good. God's first command, go forth and multiply, is the first thing God ever told us to do. Oh, no, that's bad. That's a physical act. So the Roman Catholic Church actually began teaching people for centuries. The only good thing about marriage is having children who will be celibate. Holy matrimony is simply a necessary evil to populate convents and monasteries. That's what they taught. You want to serve God, become a monk or a priest or something like that? After the Reformation happened, for all of its faults, people had a more biblical worldview and they began to see, do all things for the glory of God. A mother taking care of a baby, that's God's work. A baker baking bread, that's God's work. A physician looking after sick people, that's God's work. Do all things for the glory of God. Every Christian is a priest. Every Christian is a minister. Oh, no. It begins in the patristic era, but it gets worse. Now, remember, when people outlaw what is natural, they will do something unnatural. Just one diocese, the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Not counting legal fees, but the basic price of keeping Cardinal Mahoney out of prison was $660 million. The Archdiocese of San Diego and the Archdiocese of Los Angeles together, together with legal fees, $1 billion. That's two dioceses. Of 179 Roman Catholic dioceses and archdioceses in the United States, litigation is pending in two. In the other 177, every bishop, every archbishop, every cardinal, every diocese, every archdiocese has been found liable for protecting pedophile nuns and priests at the expense of not protecting the children whose lives they destroy. This is the doctrine of demons. That doesn't seem to bother ecumenical evangelical leaders, oh, Catholics are our brethren. It's a doctrine of demons. Well, how can you molest a child? That's unconscionable. How can you even think of a little kid in a sexual way? It's unconscionable. They have no conscience. It doesn't function anymore. Their conscience doesn't function. It's demonically branded. It's property of Satan, and it's permanently out of order. But then they go into the dietary legalism. I recall when it happened at Waco, Texas, the Branch Davidian cult, David Kodesh, 
When that happened, I was shocked, as were many people, but I was shortly afterwards in upstate New York in a snowstorm. We, we had to cancel the meeting, but I was with the pastor, and he printed 129 pages off the internet for me of accounts of people who'd been in that cult who left it before they shot it out with the FBI. I read it through 129 pages. I couldn't believe it. This guy was mad. Every day he had 13-hour Bible studies right to the moment. Right, not 13 hours in one minute, not 12 hours, 59 minutes. There were always 13 hours. Always from the book of Revelation. And he was brainwashing these people into thinking that he was some kind of an angelic being from the book of Revelation, sent to prepare them for the apocalypse. So when the apocalypse came, their salvation, their rescue, would be through their association with him. And they believed it. But the kind of control he'd have over people was unbelievable. He had the women in like a boudoir, and he had the men in like a military barracks, and he would sexually starve the men. He would not allow them to sleep with their wives. Then he'd bring attractive women up in the, during these Bible studies, and he'd make the women strip and do basically uh, profane things. Then he'd go up to the men and say, you're lusting after her, aren't you? You're lusting after her. You're a pervert. Then he'd say to the wife, that's your husband, he's a pervert. Then he'd say to their children, you see what your daddy is? Your daddy's a pervert. Look at him. He would try to emasculate these guys in the presence of their wives and children so people would only look to him as the spiritual man, <laughs> which he capitalized on because he'd sleep with all the women and even the little girls. He'd beat the women in front of their children, and they'd have to say, you see what happens to bad mommies? The fear. But then he'd get into these dietary laws, which he changed week to week. This week, chicken's okay, next week it's beef. Chicken's a sin. I couldn't understand this. It became so insane, these people were willing to follow this guy to their death, shooting it out with the FBI. The whole thing was badly handled by Janet Reno and everything, but still, the guy was crazy. Why would people follow him to their death? So when they shot it out with the feds, they actually thought that this was this apocalyptic event in the book of Revelation that they'd been prepared for. That's what they thought. And I'm reading, and I'm reading, and 129 pages. I get through about three quarters of it, and then the penny drops. Every one of those people, Diverse backgrounds. About 40% of them were from Great Britain. About a third of them were black people, a number of Hispanics. Some were middle class, most were working class. I'm trying to find the common thread. What would make people follow this nut? Then I get to it. Every single one of them, every one, had been a Seventh-day Adventist. The oldest trick in the book, literally, Galatians. Putting people in bondage to the law, trying to force people to live legalistically in the two covenants. Now, my family was Israeli. We have a mezuzah on the door. We're bilingual Hebrew English at home. We don't eat pork or shellfish. But that's to do with culture and with testimony to unsaved Jews. All things are lawful, not all things are helpful. That's all. I'd never put on anybody else. When you actually try to put people in bondage to, to the law, putting people into two covenants, this is the oldest trick in the book. How could this guy have done this? How could this Kurdish guy, guy have done this to these? No conscience. Stuart Trail, another one. The man has no conscience. No conscience. At one time, they believed the truth. But now there's something demonic. These things are going to intensify and increase in the last days. Everything created by God is good. Nothing's to be rejected if it's received with gratitude. It's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Remember when the New Testament says Jesus Christ is him on earth, when it says Christ Jesus is him in eternity. Hamashiach Yeshua Doneno. Constantly nourish on the words of faith. 
and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. Understand what the text is doing. It's comparing physical food with spiritual food. When you see people worried about kosher in a legalistic way, not in a cultural way or a testimonial way or a health conscious way, I'm not knocking culture or healthy eating, my family eats kosher, but it's not talking about that. When you see this, when people begin emphasizing this kind of physical food, it's because they're deficient in spiritual food. <coughs> As my dear friend Arnold Fruchtenbaum, probably the preeminent Messianic Jewish theologian in the United States, will tell you, two-thirds of the Messianic movement has lost its marbles. Two out of three Messianic congregations are crazy. They're going the same way as the Seventh-day Adventists. Not all of them, but most of them. They're putting Gentiles in bondage to the law. We're warned this is going to increase in the last days, and it's happening. But let's look. In pointing these things out to the brethren, you'll be a good servant. You shouldn't say that. You're being critical of your Jewish brothers. Your family are Israeli. How can you do this? You're so divisive. To... That's what they say. God says by pointing these things out. You know what's really strange? In Israel, the kooky congregations, Messianic congregations, are the minority. Israelis take Jewish identity for granted. They don't feel they have to prove it. You go to these Messianic conferences, not all of them, not all of them, but most of them, it's look how Jewish we are. You don't have to tell a Jew how to be a Jew. You don't have to tell an Eskimo how to be an Eskimo. You don't have to tell a pygmy how to be a pygmy. You have to tell people how to be disciples of Jesus, of Yeshua. Amen. A Jew knows how to be a Jew the same way as a giraffe knows how to be a giraffe or an Eskimo knows how to be an Eskimo. This is absurd. But in the last days, this nonsense increases. In Israel, the lunatic congregations, they're there, but they're the minority. Israelis take Jewish identity for granted. They don't feel they have to prove anything. It's always, look how Jewish we are. And then they try to get Gentiles to go into the law. But let's look have nothing to do with worldly fables. That word in Greek is muthos. Now understand the relationship between 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. The first pastoral epistle to Timothy, 1 Timothy, because the Holy Spirit dictates it, its commentary has to be elsewhere. As I explained day before yesterday, think of the epistles as inspired commentary. When Jesus spoke, that's the direct word of God. The apostles interpreted, explained it. The epistles are inspired commentary. So because this is also the direct word of God, say it just like this, its commentary has to be elsewhere. The commentary on, second, on 1 Timothy is in 2 Timothy. You've got the same word, muthos. This is going to transpire eschatologically. Look at 2 Timothy, please. It begins in chapter 3, verse 1. Realize this, in the last days difficult times will come. It puts it in an eschatological framework. Both texts are speaking eschatologically. We're told in verse 13 of chapter 3, evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. These con artists, money preachers on TV and things like this, yes, they deceive others, but they're also deceived themselves. They actually come to believe it. This is what the scripture again calls the spirit of error. The Lord will send a delusion upon them to make them believe what is false. God put a lying spirit in the mouth of Ahab's prophets. You want to believe a lie? I'll make you believe the lie. He gives them over to their lies and judgments. But then it continues. We're told... Verse 2 of chapter 4, again, there's no chapter, which is the Greek text. Preach the word, be ready in season, out of season. Reprove and rebuke. Stand up to error and show people when they're wrong. In love, but show them. With great patience and instruction. Great patience. Makrotumia. <laughs> be very gentle with the sheep. Shoot the wolves. <laughs> 
understand the difference. John 10, Jesus tells us there's three kinds of pastors. There's good shepherds who are like Christ, who love the sheep, who actually lay their life down for the sheep. Remember the Greek word for pastor and shepherd's the same word, episkopos. The Hebrew word is the same, ro'e, Adonai ro'i, Yahweh ro'i, ro'e, ro'e kela, pastor. You've got good shepherds, you've got wolves in sheep's clothing, and then you have hirelings. Most pastors in the church today are neither good shepherds, neither are they wolves. Most are hirelings. The ministry has become a career, at best a vocation, no longer a divine calling. Well, how do you identify a hireling from a real pastor? Jesus tells us. Only a pastor will protect the sheep from the wolves, a hireling won't. Maybe when you judge, maybe when you criticize, some people in my church love those tapes and they like to read the shack. You're not protecting the sheep from the wolves, you're feeding the sheep to the wolves. Well, I don't really believe it myself, but I don't want... What does Peter say? The pastors will give account for those sheep one day. I tremendously respect the fact that my friend and brother, my fellow New Yorker, John Higgins, stood up and told the truth about a major figure in his own movement who endorsed this insane book. Let's look. I don't mind the suspenders, but when you suspend your critical faculties, you got a problem. For the time will come, in verse 3, when they will not endure sound doctrine. They will not put up with biblical doctrine, the teaching of the apostles. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires who will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside to myths. Remember again Romans 16, 17, Dikos to Zia? They turn aside. The word there is mythos, mythos. Same word. This is explaining 1 Timothy. These unconscionable people, these false teachers with the seared conscience who are demonically inspired, will turn their ears aside to myths. Understand something. There is a market for their product. These crazy books, these nutjob counterfeit revivals you see in, in, in Lakeland and Pensacola and these things. And I say this as a Pentecostal. These things would not happen if there was not a market for it. Yeah. Satan will always be able to raise up a false shepherd, a false teacher, a false prophet. But if people wanted having itching ears, they'll turn their ears from the truth aside to muthos. Same as it says in 1 Timothy. What are these muthos? When you stop believing biblical doctrine, when you stop believing apostolic teaching, when you stop rightly dividing the Word of God, expounding Scripture, when you abandon all expository approaches to the illumination of God's Word, when you give up exegesis, you're going to substitute it with myths. A pseudo-logan. The prayer of Jabez. Not that there's anything wrong with the prayer Jabez prayed in Chronicles, but they turned it into a formula incantation. This is nuts. Or the God chasers. The scriptures where God's used to be. We have to go to where he is now. Or some of the other books we've been hearing about. These are myths. When you stop believing the logos, you'll get a pseudo-logon. You stop believing the truth, you've got to substitute it with a myth. That's what it's saying. Let's go back to 1 Timothy now. Verse 7, have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For, bo for bodily discipline is for little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life and also for the world to come. The word there is gymnos. Get the word gymnasium from it in Greek. Now understand what it's saying for old women. 
I've explained this before. It comes from 1 Corinthians. Because of the fall of man, men have become insensitive. Because of the fall of man, women have become hypersensitive. When a husband and wife get saved, it's usually the wife who gets saved first. If the husband gets saved first, the wife usually eventually becomes a believer. Not always, but usually. Water will take the shape of its container. But there's some very godly women who go through not years, but decades with unsaved husbands. Why is it usually easier for women to get saved? More sensitive. When a husband and wife pray for direction, it's usually the wife who hears from the Lord first and clearest. Why? More sensitive. The fallen nature of man has made men insensitive. I explained this with the antennas, remember? On the other hand, while it's easier for women to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, it is much easier for women to hear the voice of a counterfeit spirit. Women are much more vulnerable to spiritual seduction. That's why leadership is male. The male antenna is too short. Men just don't get it. They're thick. The antenna is too short. However, when they get the signal, it's the right one. The female antenna is too long. The female antenna can pick up any signal, sometimes two contradictory ones at the same time, which somehow they're able to make sense of. The male antenna is too short because of the fall. The female antenna is too long. But you put them both together, you'll have a wonderful reception. It is a foolish man indeed who does not carefully weigh the counsel of a praying wife. Not a nagging wife, a praying wife. If a woman nags and simply sees her husband as a ticket to get what she wants, or she's driven by insecurity and she nags, men sh shut off the radio. I don't want to hear it. Anything right she has to say as God's instrument to speak into his life or into that marriage, he's not going to hear it because she's driving him nuts. A praying wife. It is a foolish man who does not carefully weigh the counsel of a praying wife. On the other hand, it is a foolish woman indeed who does not submit to the spiritual covering of a praying husband. <laughs> Now again, he's comparing bodily discipline with spiritual discipline. Notice what you see in the New Age movement, the sensuality. It comes from Hinduism, essentially. What is coming into the emergent church? The incense, the candles, the Lectio Divina, the contemplative prayer. It appears to senses. They're confusing soul and spirit. When I was a teenager, I used to see and smoke marijuana. It had a metaphysical effect. As you can see, it hasn't worn off yet. <laughs> there are other doors into the spiritual realm other than Christ, but they're demonic. <laughs> Transcendental meditation is one of them. Mysticism is another. Gnosticism is another. And pharmacia, psychedelic drugs, is another. Be careful of things which use sensuality or misrepresents sensuality as being spiritual. This is Gnostic, it is Hinduistic, it is New Age. The emergent church, contemplative prayer, the Lectio Divina, that's what it is. They actually see in their books their ideal. It's not going back to the book of Acts or even to the church fathers. They see the ideal age, the third through the eighth centuries, where you have the mystics and the monks and things like this. That's their ideal of spirituality. Well, that was the age where paganistic influences, basically through Alexandria, particularly through Alexandria, came into Christendom. The Buddhists had monks long before Christians. You had Christians wanting a deeper spiritual life from the carnality that came into the church after Constantine. They met the Buddhist monks, so they go into the desert and make monasteries and thought they could be more spiritual. The Celtic monks, monks did the same thing in Ireland. But it's based on sensuality to a large degree. This comes back in the last days. It makes a big comeback in the last days, this rebirth of mysticism. And it's happening. They emphasize these exercises. You actually have people 
Joyce Huggett in Britain is one of them, saying to use the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola as a model for Christian prayer. These visualization techniques are pure new age. Ignatius Loyola is the founder of the Jesuits, established to stop the spread of the gospel in the aftermath of the Reformation. The Dominicans may have butchered up to a half million Jews and Christians alive before with the Inquisitions, before the Reformation. That was the cartoon before the movie compared to what the Jesuits did afterwards. Yet we're supposed to go to these very people who killed our forefathers and imitate them, visualize. Well, if you read the, the, the exercises of Ignatius Loyola, he says, if Holy Mother the Church, quote unquote, tells us it is daylight and it's dark, we must believe it's daylight. In other words, you use these visualization techniques to become so brainwashed and deluded and non-critical in your thinking that you'll believe what you're told just because you're told to believe it. This was the basis of Roman Catholic education. Give us a child to the age of seven and he's ours for life. Truth no longer becomes what truth actually is objectively, it becomes what's dictated. It's like Sovietism. They had two publications, Pravda and Izvestia. Pravda means truth in Russian. Truth was not what was objectively so, truth was the party line, what was dictated by the party. That's the truth. <laughs> Whether it's right or wrong, true or false, well, that, was, that was irrelevant. It's truth because the party said it was. It's true because the Pope said it was. It's true because the televangelist said it is. These things in the last days will come into the church. People who once professed to believe the truth will depart from biblical Christianity. These people are total hypocrites. They will come under demonic influence. They'll write things which they represent to be the word of God or as the word of God, a pseudo-logan, and their conscience will be seared. They'll have no conscience about doing it. But there'll be people who will want to hear these myths. And they're doing it. It's a trustworthy statement deserving of full acceptance. For it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Notice he's the Savior of all men, especially believers. Same epistle, chapter 2 of 1 Timothy, verse 4, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. I have a very high regard for many moderate Calvinists, preachers, theologians. I love John Bunyan. I love William Carey. I love Charles Spurgeon. There are a few people I respect today as much as I do John MacArthur. may not agree with them on every point, but I respect these men. But you know what? Historically, as I pointed out day before yesterday, moderate Calvinists have always been attacked by extreme ones. Spurgeon was. William Carey was. Today, John MacArthur is. Be careful of those people who say he's not the savior of all men. He only saved the elect. It's limited atonement. No, he's the savior of all men, especially those who believe. The distinction is made between the believers and the non-believers, but he died for all. They get into these doctrines. Look at Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. It's speaking about believers during the Great Tribulation. That is where the term perseverance of the saints comes from. It is not this unconditional one saved, always saved. Now whether or not you believe in perseverance is one thing, but the term perseverance of the saints used biblically does not mean that in its context. It's talking about people in the book of Revelation at a specific future time in history. One of the things that's making a big comeback now is hyper-Calvinism and its adjuncts. Covenant theology, which is inherently replacementist, inherently supersessionist. Again, many moderate Calvinists don't believe this, but you know what? If you don't believe in infant baptism, if you don't believe in patristic authority, the church fathers as doctrinal authority, if you don't believe in Erastianism, a state church, and if you don't believe in covenant theology, that God only ever made two covenants, one with Adam and one with Abraham, real Calvinists wouldn't say you're a Calvinist. In the 16th century, you would have been called an Anabaptist.
And the Catholics and Protestants both would have killed you. John Calvin did not define Calvinism. It was defined by the remonstrance of Dort by Beza and his followers. Just think, if you don't believe in sprinkling infants, you hold to believers' baptism, they would have called you an Anabaptist in the Reformation. The Protestants would have killed you as fast as the Catholics. They did. Lutherans, Zwingliists. In other words, a lot of people say they're Calvinists, but they really aren't. Not in the sense of what a real Calvinist is. I know plenty of people who say they're Calvinists, but they believe in the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews. Well, doctrinaire Calvinism precludes that possibility. And we've got people going into this stuff now, and they're getting followers. People like R.C. Sproul, D. James Kennedy, he's dead now. But understand what happens. You have the pendulum effect. Because people have seen charismania, because they've seen counterfeit revivals in Toronto, Pensacola, things like that, Lakeland, because they've seen the insanity, they go to the opposite direction with the pendulum swings. They think the, the diametric 180 degree opposite of what they came from it must be right. <laughs> There's a via media. You don't correct error with error. You correct error with truth. Beware of hyper-Calvinism. And again, I have no argument with moderate Calvinists. Some of my closest friends are that. My argument is with the extreme Calvinists. I have no argument with moderate Charismatics and moderate Pentecostals. My argument is with the extreme ones. It's always the lunatic fringe that gives everybody else a bad name in all these issues. But what do the lunatic fringe do? Heresis. They create a schism on that basis. They create a schism on that basis. You're either with us and take on board all of our beliefs, or you know, goes right back to Romans 16, 17. And so it goes. Let's look again at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 11, prescribe and teach these things. We're not told or encouraged or exhorted. It is imperative. Prescribe and teach these things. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. This is very similar to what God told Jeremiah. God does not reckon age biologically. It's not based on birth. It's based on second birth. How long since you've been saved? I know people in their mid to late 20s who are perfectly qualified to be pastors. They got saved when they were 15, learned the word of God. I know people in their 50s who are still in a playpen. Right. Age is not based on birth. It is based on second birth. Let's continue. But rather in speech, conduct, love, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Leadership is always by example. It wasn't just what Jesus said, it's the way he lived out what he said. He led and taught by example as well as by words. So it says, first prescribe and teach these things, teach the doctrine, but then show people how to live it out in your own life. Until I come give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Verse 13. You've got three basic kinds of teaching in the New Testament. Homelia, Didaskin, and Kerygma. Kerygma is evangelistic preaching. It's preaching the gospel to the unsaved. Okay. Didaskin is the exposition of doctrine, what we're doing now. And Homelia is exhortation. Think of a tripod. A tripod. It cannot possibly stand without all three legs. Kerygma, Didaskin, Homelia. If a church or congregation does not preach the gospel, teach doctrine, and exhort the flock, it's going to fall. You need all three legs. Okay. Let's look a little bit further. John Wesley, in verse 13, he said at the end of his life, at the end of the 18th century, 
Methodism is already declining because people are negating the reading and exposition of Scripture. John Wesley said, if this is what's happening to the Methodist church when I'm alive, what's going to happen when I'm dead? Calvary Chapel was founded on expository preaching. Verse by verse, I'm not saying that's the only way, but it is a good way and it's a solid way. You're never going to go wrong with doing it. More and more Calvary chapels are departing from the original example of Chuck Smith the same way as Methodists departed from the original example of John Wesley in the 18th century. I see more Calvaries getting into this nuttiness, into the purpose-driven lie, into these programs. They're getting away from Scripture. When you depart from the truth of Scripture, you wind up believing a myth. And so he tells him, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed upon you through prophetic utterance and with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Another error that comes into play in the last days is cessationism. Oh, these gifts were only for the early church. We don't need them now. Well, the context is eschatological. We are warned against people who teach against charismata, the same as we should warn about people who teach charismania. We should warn about those who teach against charismata. Look with me, please, to Romans chapter 11, verse 29. Bearing in mind there's no chapter divisions in the original Greek text, let's look at this. For the gifts, charismata, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Again, take out the 12 for chapter 12. It's not there in the original text. Romans 9, 10, and 11 speaks about God's eternal election of Israel and his prophetic purposes for Israel salvifically in relation to the church. That's Romans 9, 10, and 11. When you get to chapter 12, look what it says. Let each exercise them accordingly of prophecy according to the proportion of his faith. Prophecy is a charismatic gift. It's service in his service, and teaching in his teaching, and so forth. So chapter 12 talks about gifts, including charismatic gifts. Chapter 11 talks about God's election of Israel. Why would you put God's calling of Israel together with a something about the gifts? The gifts and calling go forth without repentance. That same misguided mentality that says God's purpose for the Jews, that was for then, it's not for now, is part and parcel of the same misguided mentality that says the gifts were for then, it's not for now. <laughs> Replacement theology and cessationism go hand in hand. They are two manifestations of the same erroneous thinking. And they're both increasing in the last days. As the era of charismat charismania is increasing, the era of Cessationism <coughs> is increasing. Verse 15, take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress may be evident to all. In the last days, we're supposed to sweat over this stuff. Take pains with it so people can see we're progressing. We will be progressing at a, turn, at a time the mainstream churches are regressing. You understand Christianity is declining. The Western world is becoming increasingly post-Christian, neo-pagan. What we say in Hebrew, it's going down. It's, it's in regression. They should see that we have a progression. But we will only have that progression if we take pains with these things. Not in just what we teach, but in what we do. Verse 16, in conclusion, pay close attention to yourself and your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourselves and for those who hear you. This is the biblical teaching on perseverance. It is not the misuse of that verse from Revelation 14. You can be absolutely sure you're going to heaven. You can be absolutely sure you're covered. You can be absolutely sure you won't fall away. How? 
by paying close attention to yourself and your doctrine, by persevering in these things. This is the real perseverance of the saints. I traveled outside of Britain. When I leave Britain and come to America, I have medical insurance for when I travel abroad. I know that if something happens to me, God forbid, I can go to any hospital, here's my card, get any medical treatment I require, if required, I can get an ambulance flight and get medevac back to the UK. All I have to do is pay the premiums. <laughs> I have the assurance. I'm all right, I'm covered, I know it. We can have the absolute assurance of salvation. You're covered, don't worry about it. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Watch your conduct and watch your doctrine. If someone's conduct goes off, they will begin going off doctrinally. When you see somebody go off doctrinally, they've walked away from their relationship with the Lord in the terms of what it should be. When people go off spiritually, they will go off doctrinally. If people go off doctrinally, they will go off spiritually. You think about these guys, you know, it's, it's happened too many times. The pastor runs off with the church secretary. I, I can't tell you how many times I've known things like that happen. And everybody's shocked and surprised. This guy didn't wake up one day and decide to take off with a babe and throw his life and his ministry and his career and his reputation out there and his marriage out the window. It was a simply a coming to the surface of something that had been wrong in that guy's life all along. Yeah. But you notice when people begin to go off, they begin teaching flimsy doctrines. They begin compromising on issues doctrinally and otherwise. Why are they compromising on doctrine? Because they're compromising on morality, ethics, integrity. When people go off doctrinally, they're going off spiritually. That will eventually express itself in some moral way, some moral flaw. Likewise, when people begin to go off spiritually, their doctrine will go off. Wrong doctrine will follow wrong conduct. Wrong conduct will follow wrong doctrine. These things have always been true. They are general truths. But in the last days, they become acute truths, paramount truths. This is what the Spirit explicitly says about the last days. God bless. <laughs>